nature. You know, in the first case, somebody can argue that it was a robbery case, though the young man at the center of it says he was sent to do so. But you know, of course, the, the matter must be determined properly mm -hmm. by the court. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, we hear they were returning from a the campaign, campaign yeah. and just before his house, you know, the armed guys got there, asked them who was the MP. Yeah. And I heard they were all quiet until he owned up, and then they just shot him and ran away. This, this, this clearly could be a case of contract killing, and that makes it very, very dangerous. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's happening that way. I think it resurrects the discussion mm. about security for, for, security for, for the MPs. I, I have always maintained a position that, yes, we have to, because we have three arms of government, the executive, ministers, etc. I mean, DCs have police escorts. Mm. The judges, I think, from the high court above, the lower courts, they have police escorts in the day when they are working, etc. But the high court and above have police escorts wherever they go. So mm -hmm. if you have three arms of government, you've made provisions for mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. why do you leave out the legislature? You know, I, I, I think the very nature of their job, and given that they are in a very difficult time because they are running for election or re-election, I mean, they become targets, even their families. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's an important thing for the state to consider. Of course, there are many, so it will mean that yeah. you need not less yeah. than 275 mm. yeah. police officers just Is dedicated the to MPs. That's the tearing us from really... Uh, going into that discussion or in but, terms of but, uh, doing well, it for them. But, you know, that shouldn't be the case. It's a decision we've made. We have decided to, <laughs> to, to, to dice up our constituencies or areas into 20, 275 constituencies. And democracy is expensive. If, if, if we've chosen this path, I think we must speak as people who have chosen this path. Yeah. I mean, assigning one police officer to a member of parliament I don't think it's difficult, too difficult to ask for, given the fact that if something happens to them, the cost to the nation is huge. Mm. You know, um, had it not been that we were close to an election, yeah. I'm sure we would have had a, a by election. election. And the cost it's of that expensive. by election is expensive. Other things, the, the, the eternal loss yeah. to the family of yeah. the, that person and, and to the constituents, I, I think you can't really quantify it. So I, I think it's about time the state critically looked at providing them with security. I think they deserve it. They deserve it. Could you share in that thought? Yeah, very, very sad story. Them. We heard it this morning and um, we've heard different accounts of what happened and it shows that we, we need to pay attention to people like that. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. We are in the electoral season. People will be running around. If anything that has happened before is, is, is anything to go by. You see the previous elections when monocracy plays a role, see people traveling to towns and villages, sometimes sharing money and all those things. It's, it's, it's value that will be traveling across the country in this particular period, so we need to improve the security. On, on, on what has happened, the IGP has spoken. There's a bounty set for whoever would mm -hmm. help with information to lead to the arrest yes. of the perpetrators. Now, the president has also spoken that the state will do everything possible to arrest those involved and to bring justice to the late MP. A lot of people have also called for saying that we should investigate this and bring closure to the family and also to the country. But on the issue of MPs being given security, I'm a bit divided here, very. This mm. is why. We have about 30,000 police officers in the country mm -hmm. for a population of about 30 million, right? So if you do the mathematics, just cross out the zeros and you know the number of police personnel per person. Now out of this 30,000, off the top of my head, about three, four, five thousand may be administrative staff who would not have anything to do with operations. Mm -hmm. So you have about 20, 25,000 left for operations. Now, the question is, if we improve security nationwide around this time, would it help all of us and give us a better system, or we should rather think about assigning security or policemen to these MPs? That's where my division is. I, I agree that the legislature, the, the legislature needs to be protected very well. I agree that people in public office need to be protected. But around this time, knowing what is happening all around us, is it a matter of just the MPs or a matter of general insecurity? Of insecurity and insecurity, because yeah. last week there was a, I, I think two buses, Kumasi Akara Road, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
armed robbers, they shot into mm -hmm, the buses. Mm -hmm. One person mm -hmm. was hit in the mm -hmm. eye. Mm -hmm. People were injured. They robbed them. Yeah. This week, some people uh, on a campaign tour were yeah, attacked by armed robbers. Yeah, if you go to Kumase, there are mobile money vendors who have been injured. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who have been killed. There's an SDA man who was robbed. Um, so these stories have been coming up these days. So is it a matter of us looking at our security operations, our highway patrols, and all the various things to enable us deal with some of these things. I think um, that's where I am looking at this from. Because you run through some of the urban areas, and you see, and this thing, I've taken it up on the radio before, you see police checkpoints, mm -hmm. and you'd expect them to check your vehicle and ask you questions and everything. You get there, and the first thing they ask you is, Officer, and they in the mirror, it's late. Can we get something? Mm -hmm. And I feel that the police service should deploy their men strategically with the right instructions to secure all of us. I believe if we improve the general security around these times, because election brings up about the hotspots and all the various issues, maybe the key actors in this electoral period would also have a sense of security. And mind you, um, the political parties also around this time, even though we are disbanding political party vigilantes and all that, still have their own sort of bodyguards who guard mm -hmm. some of these people. Mm -hmm. So if you improve security generally, and on the highway, that's the R80, where this MP sad event occurred, if there were security patrols all around effectively being executed, maybe, 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 all the people along the stretch will be protected, including the people in that particular convoy. So I believe the, the main actors, the politically exposed mm -hmm. people, they need to be protected. But I think that looking at the resources and the needs of the country at the moment, we need to look at it holistically to think about our general security as a country, step up border patrols because around these times too, um, all sorts of things can happen. We know what happened in the Volta region uh, with respect yeah, to the, the, the Western the Togoland thing. So good. I think it's a matter of a general stepping up of the intelligence of national security, the police service, Ministry of Interior must also step up so we improve the general security situation in the country. Okay. Because if what happened in Western Togoland happened without prior intelligence and without Western anybody talking. Western Togoland, West, no. West, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying the Western portion. Togoland the, the, issue. The I'm, issue. I'm referring yeah. to that issue, not that there's a Western Togoland. So viewers should forgive yes, me. Please. If it happened and our security agencies could, didn't know this and couldn't move into position yeah. to prevent these things, yeah. it gives us an indication that something is amiss. Mm -hmm. If VIP buses are being attacked, and the mm -hmm. VIP people, now, tell them, listen to this, VIP says that now the state should provide them security. Mm -hmm. So the other transport companies will say, state should provide the security. Do we have the, the resources to put to sort armed policemen on every bus? They come armed policemen for every, so, so I think that we the police service has managed security in the country for years. Okay. They have the data, they know the hotspots, they know the modus operandi of a lot of these security people. And the truth is our police service, they are, small, they are among the smartest and some of the sharpest in the world. Mm -hmm. They just need to sit up and do the right job. Okay. Yes, so, I, I mean, uh, yeah. a quick one. Uh, yes, the, I, I mean, good points could you raise uh, But we, we can't say we want to wait for the general security of the country to improve before we provide security for MPs. In 2016, I, I think that if the MP, J.B. Danko, had had a police escort stationed with him at his home, I'm not sure we would have been at the same place today. This gentleman, if he had had a police escort, mm. I'm not sure it would have happened this way. Maybe there could have been some resistance, I don't know. You see, uh, has the general security of the country improved before we assign judges police officers, before we assign the executive police officers. So I, I think it's a hard decision, but that is the path we have, we have taken. Democracy, we say, is expensive. I think it's important. I mean, we want quality people to get into politics. We want to discourage the, 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 the situation where powerful people have their own security. You know, so once we want to discourage those things, and now we have an anti-vigilantism law, etc., I think the state must step up take responsibility and provide security for some of these people. Of course, crime is crime. Crime happens everywhere. But even in areas where there is what we may call tight security, mm. 
crimes still happen. People mm. still die. Just that we don't have them in the numbers we may see in, in maybe areas like ours. But I think that necessarily our MPs deserve, you know, a proper form of security funded by the state. I think it's very important. I think the MPs generally have been, and I, I know a lot of people will not be happy with this point, but they, 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 they have been, uh, they've not been treated fairly or well when, when you look at the other arms of government. So for example, they will have, they have to make certain contributions to the purchase of their own cars, while the judiciary or the executive doesn't do that, and a few other things. The, 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 the issue normally is that they are many. We have decided to do it, so let, let, let's do it. Now we are talking about life and death, people shooting people, people cr killing people in, in this manner. Yeah. You live indelible pain in the hearts of families and, yeah. and people. It, it shouldn't happen that somebody just for self, wanting to serve his country hasn't done anything so, so bad as far as we know mm -hmm. and get killed in this fashion. And, and from the way things happen in Ghana sometimes, it will shock you that we will never find these killers. I'll be happy if we find them and we'll do everything we can as media or as, as, as individuals to ensure these persons are found. But in some cases, you will never find them. You know, uh, I, I, I think <sighs> we really have to look at that. We and I think it throws uh, up another issue yeah. too. I mean, today is, 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 is end of filing nominations. What happens to, 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 to that area? What happens to the seat? Because I'm sure he's filed or he was in the process yeah, of filing. I, I, he, he had filed. You know, so he what happens? The, should the MPP go without a candidate in the area? Or what happens? I was well, listening to a discussion. Some of the people were saying if the wife will, will want to take it, yeah, they will support yeah, her to go yeah, for it and things yeah. like that. I don't know how well, it they plays. have to take a decision whether quickly, they will and the yeah, decision quickly. Must be quickly. I don't think... buy the situation where we will say, given the situation, the EC should make special no, concession. I'm, I'm no, not, I don't, I don't no, buy that. No, no. So they need to make a decision yeah, quickly yeah. and get somebody because there. Because we so had, uh, is it two days ago, um, the NDC's uh, candidate, uh, someone in the Eastern region, also passed away suddenly, and mm. they quickly met and then chose somebody to, to, to take up that uh, position. So we'll be monitoring these activities. Uh, we'll have a uh, comprehensive um, coverage of this um, sad event on our news bulletin tonight at 8 o'clock, also on Eyewitness News on radio at 5.30. So you'd want to tune in or watch these uh, two uh, spots to get updates on that. But guys, uh, let's, let's uh, go to uh, uh, the reason why we're here today as well. Uh, which is looking at uh, the candidates. So like you were saying earlier, today is the last day for if you want to run as a president or as a parliamentarian, today is the last day for you to file uh, with the EC. And um, so far for the presidential candidates, we're seeing uh, aspirants, we've seen 15. Huh. That's a huge one. Um, they've all filed interesting, and parliament, of course, the various political parties have. Uh, so let's start with um, the... Um, uh, presidential and parliamentary uh, filing of nominations and first of all let's look at the the, uh, the, the costs in filing for the presidential 100,000 the parliamentary 10,000 there's been a lot of discussions during the time that the, the numbers were released of course the parliamentarians is the same figure like last four years but we are seeing an increase in the 100,000 cities is it Okay, or I mean, if you're going to run for president and people say if you're going to run for president and you can't afford 100,000, then you have no business going there at all. Yeah, um, that's what I've heard people say. Um, if you look at the figures, last year it was 50. Mm -hmm. Last year, I mean 2016. 2016, yeah. It was 50,000 cities. Now it's at 100,000 cities. If you look at the figures historically, indeed, in 1996, the presidential aspirants filing fee was 500 cities. Mm -hmm. um, in the parliamentary was 200 cities, 2000 to 2004, presidential was 500 cities, parliamentary was 200 cities. Now 2008, presidential was 5,000 cities, parliamentary was 500 cities. 2012, presidential was 10,000 cities, parliamentary was 1,000. Then comes 2016, it moved from 10,000 cities for, for presidential to 50,000 cities. Mm -hmm. Parliamentary moved from 1,000 to 10,000 cities. Now, 2020, we are at 100,000 cities. If you look at the jumps, okay, from 92 to 96 to 2000, 2004, 2008, they were gradual, um, increases. gradual increases. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you come to 2016, mm -hmm. and the thing jumps from 10,000 cities to 50,000 cities. Mm -hmm. 
and then we moved to 100,000 cities. That's what, if you remember very well, in 2016, when it was increased, the opposition then was not happy. Yeah. They were really, really, really unhappy with this. And I remember the NDC said, well, when um, um, the NDC General Secretary, Johnson Nisidin Johnson Ketia, Nisidin. went to file the, the, the nominations for uh, then President Mahama in the company of the Vice President then, he said the NDC was paying for all the parliamentary candidates. Mm -hmm. That was a little over 2 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. The opposition had an issue with it. So come 2020, it increased from 50,000 to 100,000. And the government now, or people in the government now, who were then in opposition, who had an issue, are saying, oh, it's OK. It's the EC's thing. I, I, I believe, as a country, too, we need to have a policy around some of these things and a structure to guide some of these things. Just like any other thing, if um, the, a school, like the University of Ghana, right, mm -hmm. is going to increase their school fees, it's mm -hmm. subject to parliamentary approval. If the Ghana Health Service reviews their fees, it's subject to parliamentary approval. Fees and payments and a lot of things are usually subject to some form of approval. So there's a system that will vet the fees and the reasoning for setting that fee to approve it. But in this case, we all know that the EC is an independent body, but it's still a body that works within a state system yeah. which should do certain things to, to, to fit into a certain policy yeah. guideline. Yeah. So I feel there should mm. be there should be a way to standardize this. Yeah, but do we know what goes into picking the figures for the EC, for example? I, I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite arbitrary um, uh, because I don't think necessarily the EC uses that money to run the elections yeah, yeah. because in any case the money some of it is returned to the candidates mm -hmm, who mm -hmm. pass a certain mm -hmm, threshold in mm -hmm, terms of percentage of mm -hmm, votes yeah. you know garnet and the ec is funded by the state yeah. so <coughs> the state necessarily funds the activities of the ec right. so in my view it is just a kind of a bar or barrier mm -hmm. to sieve out Everybody, you can imagine if it was free. Yeah, we'll have a lot more people mm -hmm. going through. Of course, there could be the argument that money shouldn't be a barrier to people wanting to serve in public office. Yes, that, that's true. But when you are serving in that public office, you should have some ability to be able to mobilize yeah. a bit of resources. That I think is important. Talking about that, so that's I mean, talking about the presidential, they don't pay that money themselves. The mm -hmm. candidates don't pay themselves. They come under the umbrella of the party. So. The party, I'm thinking, will have to find resources to yeah. do so. So that is why I, I, don't, I didn't really buy uh, Bridget Jogbenuku's point that women aspirants should have a discount. Because she is not paying from her pocket, as far as I know. They come under the umbrella of the party. So the party should be able to mobilize mm. and, 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 and pay for them. But some of the smaller parties, they or have the a challenges or the independent yes. with Who the, don't have the machinery yeah, of a party. To get the, the finance like the big guys to have. So most of the time you find that the lead people in the party or even the uh, flag bearers are footing mo most of the bills. Not to say that it's the mm -hmm. same with PPP, but uh, you see that yes. a lot so, with so the in, small So in terms ones. of the, the independence, maybe we can have a discussion around that. Yeah. But, but the danger there too will be that if you just open it, you will have Everybody so going. many people coming up mm. as independent candidates wanting to do that. Of course, yeah. we've heard in the past, and we're still here, that some people obviously know they will not win. They just come to run for president to, to better their to CV, CV. <laughs> and, and, and to brighten their, 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 their business brighten opportunities their and chances. Be, yeah. you know, so that is what yeah. really it is. Because you, can have, you just ask yourself, we've not had independent candidates in presidential elections in this country, at least in the Fourth Republic, mm. crossing 1%. In mm -hmm. fact, 0.5, we've not mm -hmm. even had. Mm -hmm. So why the, 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 I don't want to call it a craze to contest as independent. So there certainly should be a reason. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and I've heard it many times that they, they use it for for, 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 for business. <laughs> it it puts a lot of it gives a lot of weight to their C V and their personality yeah, when they travel outside for a business candidate. meeting. This guy was a presidential candidate in, in, in Ghana's twenty sixteen election or twenty twenty election. It adds to them and it, it helps them build uh, maybe their, their, their business portfolio better. But, but know, we for, are for trying to, I mean, with uh, Bridget's uh, concerns about uh, giving uh, women uh, discounts, I mean, we're trying to encourage women to go into politics. Most of them um, really may not have the financial muscle 
So is it really out of place to push it, no, that it, agenda to pull more women in, into politics, it, 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 it really? to support women, yes. But I, I'm also not for <laughs> genderizing things like that. <laughs> Could you just remind us that in 2016, yeah. Asedi Nketiah, on behalf of the party, or the party through Asedi Nketiah, paid for all parliamentary candidates. 2.75 million mm -hmm. so, Ghana cities. I mean, it's neither yet. So, it's, it's, so we, we don't know if the candidates pay for themselves. If we know that the candidates pay for themselves, then we can have a conversation around that. But in this case, it's obvious the party pays for them. Mm -hmm. So if the party pays for them, so it means you are, you are giving this. It doesn't matter whether it's a male or female. because yeah. so let, Let's pay. look at it this way. It, it, it may be controversial. But you see, when your party is in office, like in the case you of 2016, more money. They have the power of incumbency and the resources. So I believe that's, that's what pushed the NDC to pay for all the candidates. Have you heard that this year the NDC is paying for all their candidates while they are in opposition? That's number one. Number two, we know that in this country, whether you mobilize, you are, you're a good person who can mobilize funds for your campaign or not, once you are taking a lot of resources from others, once you get into office, people expect you to sort of pay them back one way yeah. or the other, which yeah. encourages corruption. Yeah. Right. So if there's a way we can do this without burdening the candidates too much, because the truth is, whether you like it or not, especially when your party is in opposition, when your party is in opposition, the likelihood that you would have to fund a lot of the things yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a key thing. Yeah. There's no two ways about that. If you are an independent candidate, the likelihood that you'd have to find the initial capital to run is also there. So I think we, sh we, sh we need to look at this. Now, in 2016, this is how Kodeo described the EC's filing fees. Kodeo, in a statement, and I quote, fees set for filing by candidates obtaining accreditation for domestic election observers and media were arbitrary. For example, filing fee of 50,000 cities for the presidential and 10,000 Ghana cities for the parliamentary candidates in 2016 was too high. This was CODEO, the Coalition of um, domestic, domestic Election, election Observers. Election. So we said this in 2016. Four years on, talk inflation, apply all the economics to this. <laughs> it's 100,000 cities, a fair jump, based on all that the various actors have said since 1996, since we recorded figures for increment of uh, filing fees. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's something we need to look at. Now, on the female entrepreneurs and the female candidates thing, in Ghana, according to data available, majority of entrepreneurs are female. Mm -hmm. But they are the people who get the least in incomes. Exactly. So even though the bulk of entrepreneurs are females, because when it comes to incomes... Them, you, the more, a majority of yeah. them in the informal sector, for example, tabletop. Yes. So when Small it comes to capital. incomes, they earn the least compared to their male yeah. counterparts. And it, we, are, we, are, we are in a country that is promoting inclusion. Mm -hmm. Political parties say when they come, they'll make these number of people ministers. They'll try to encourage these number of people to get into parliament. We want a parliament with more women. So is it a case where we are saying we want it, but we don't want to sit back and look at how we, we can... Um, um, reduce we claim their we want it, but we are not helping. The, so, the so I, I think these thing are things work. based on <laughs> earning capacity in the country, yeah. and based on other factors. We can look at these and, and make a point because at the constituency level and at the parliamentary level, before you even become candidate, the amount of money you would spend and the stress you go through, and then you become candidate, and as a woman, you have to also find some ten thousand cities or fifty thousand cities or a hundred thousand cities. For, for filing, we really need to look yeah. at it. There's yeah. a case for the number of people who may want to run if the bar was lowered, such that if the EC has to print, say, only one sheet per constituency, or for the presidential election, only one sheet, and about 20 people run, we may have to print four sheets. That means we are spending more. three three times three more extra, than we would yeah. have spent. There's a case to be made for that, but we can we can sit down and look at all these dynamics. And, and look at how we set some of these fees. 50,000 okay. to 100,000, from 10,000 to 50,000. It's something we really need but, to But you see, the, the, the EC doesn't use that money for no. anything. Yeah, Indeed, Sribo uh, uh, Kwaku uh, is on record to have said the EC doesn't use that money for anything. Indeed, that's the case. But when you look at CI 127 uh, Regulations 8, 1B, 
It states that a candidate for presidential and parliamentary election shall, at the time of nomination of the candidate, deposit or cause to be deposited an amount of money determined by the EC. So it is arbitrarily determined by the EC. They, they have the power to do so. But whether they use that money to do anything or to do something at all, they don't. You know. So I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from an, an interview Cerebral uh, Kwaku granted Daily Graphic a while ago, some, some time ago, I mean in September. I said the EC cannot and does not use the filing fees of candidates for anything. So if some people are saying that the commission is using it as a means to raise funds for its activities, it is not true because the money is not for us. It belongs to the state and they are paid into the consolidated fund. Okay. So, so the essence of what they are doing really is to put value on the office they are, they are trying to seek, just to seek out the numbers or to, fil to, to filter out the numbers so that we don't have just anybody you know, trying to run for president for, for, for whatever reason. So okay. I think it's a test of your seriousness yeah. to, to, to go for the office, okay. I, I think so. All right, I'll take a, a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll look at the nominations proper, then we'll move into the independent candidate uh, matters. Uh, stay with us, we'll be right back. really knows how to take care of her family. Now, it's my turn. And like her, I only want the freshest food. I'm glad there's Samsung Twin Cooling Refrigerator, which retains 70% humidity, extending freshness up to two times longer. And with extended freshness, I can extend my care for my family. Welcome back to the Voters Diary. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, I'm here with Salama Dono as well as Kojo Boating. We're looking at the uh, filing fees for presidential parliamentary candidates as well as um, the nomination uh, process as well. Today is the last day for those who are interested in becoming parliamentarians or presidents to file uh, their nomination with the EC. Later, we'll look at the uh, independent candidates as well. We're seeing quite a number across and um, back and forth over whether they should go or not. But you can join the conversation. You can send us a message via uh, Facebook or Twitter. Remember to add the hashtag Voters Diary, or you can send us via WhatsApp on the number currently on your screen. So, uh, guys, let me play you a short clip. Um, this week, we've seen um, uh, President uh, Kufado himself going to the EC to file. For the NDC, we saw its General Secretary General, um, General Secretary Johnson Asedu and Ketia going to file on behalf of the former president, among others. But let me take you to the EC and give you an idea of who came there and how it panned out. Considerable confidence for the majority of people in our country. In the rule and in the leadership of the Electoral Commission, we have people who are committed to a free, fair, credible, and transparent person. We hope that that will mark the conduct of the elections of 7 December. I am not interested in any crooked results. I do not want to be a president elected by deceit. I look forward to a contest that will be fairly conducted so that if indeed by the grace of the Almighty I am again the choice of the Ghanaian people, it will be one that has been freely and openly demonstrated. I, I don't think there's any, unless you have some kind of hidden agenda, I don't think anybody can doubt the the fairness of the processes that have so far been exhibited. We are all witnesses to the process. 
And I think that all serious-minded Ghanaians are clear in their mind that they're witnessing a fair process. There are some who are investing in trying to discredit the process for their own sectarian ends. I'm not one of them. We have a situation where we are called upon to file nominations. Where there is a big doubt as to which register is going to be the best document for the filing. Even today, the electoral commission is exhibiting part of the register based upon which you are supposed to file nominations. And it is called provisional register because it has not been certified. We were unable to come at 11 o'clock because this morning, some of our supporters who had uh, completed the document provided their voter ID numbers were calling that the commission has called to change their ID cards. So we want to put on record that we are filing these nominations because they say so. And we will not boycott the elections. No matter what system they put in place, we will still participate in the elections and win. A lot of people think that I will be running as a presidential candidate I have actually taken the position of a running mate. And then we've just decided Mr. Alfred Kwame Walker will be taking the presidential slot and I will take his running mate. That is what we've actually presented to the Electoral Commission. And uh, uh, Walker was, is Mr. Alfred Kwame Asiedu Walker. He's the one that, uh, and then I will be taking uh, the second position. We just want to demonstrate to Ghanaians and all of us is that leadership is about influence. Leadership is not about struggle. Leadership is about serving the people. Leadership is about recognizing the fact that the others too also have the potential. And so I have run for twice as presidential candidate, and for that matter, as independent uh, uh, as parents, uh, we came together and said that uh, let's make Alfred Kwame Walker, who was uh, also an independent presidential candidate in 2016, but unfortunately he couldn't qualify. And so we all team up, and he is going to be the presidential candidate. The, the, the NDP is happy uh, to go through the uh, processes that have been laid by the Electoral Commission this year. Uh, we had gone through uh, a very stormy process in the past, but I think this year we find it quite friendly because for the first time I think the Commission took the trouble to give us a checklist and it comes within our belief that this, our, I mean, any disagreement with institutions must not be over dramatized as if uh, Amagadon is going to fall on us. I think the provisional register, we all know that, yes, as you heard me, I told them that even if there are challenges, they should also consider the fact that we have a provisional register. Even they themselves will encounter challenges. But they should brace their belt, okay, for 2020 election, because this register is a new register, and it has never been used for any election. So the first election is going to be the, this 2020, which is a crucial one. So they should expect a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, difficulties. A vote for the CPP is a vote for yourself. For too long, Ghanaians have been told that voting for the Convention People's Party is a wasted vote. Rather, voting for the NPP and the NDC is the wasted vote because they continue to give false hope, they continue to give promises which they don't fulfill. And then years later, we only see that they are there serving their own self-interest, the interests of their friends and families, and the interests of their parties, not the Ghanaian. And it's only the Convention People's Party that has a history and a foundation of serving only the people of Ghana and not in the individual's concern. So these are the men and women who want to lead the country um, this uh, elections 2020. We have um, 15 groups, uh, 15, 12 political parties sponsored uh, um, persons and three independent aspirants. 
not too huge uh, the numbers. Yeah, I think it's quite a huge number, 15. I'm not sure if this is the, the, the biggest we've had uh, since, uh, I mean, the, the, the start of the fourth Republican constitution. It, it, it certainly is it, it's a large number. I am not sure if that means anything for a first round victory, because increasingly we have grown, um, we, we have grown like a two-party state. Mm -hmm. So if it were before, maybe 2,000 or prior to that, we would say that maybe the smaller parties will take yeah. a bit of the votes away, mm -hmm. so the two major parties may not have enough for a first round win. But if 2016 is anything to go by, we saw that collectively all these other parties did not make up to even 5%. So uh, I, I think it's an indication of the fact that maybe people are increasingly uh, fed up with the NDC and NPP dominance. And so people are looking for opportunities to sell themselves out to the public, aside from those who are doing it for business interests, yeah, so that maybe they can sell the message to the people and get people to test them. And it's also so because, it, because of the disillusionment that people have felt. So uh, a few people, some of the candidates feel that when they sell their <laughs> messages to people or when they are testing their grounds, because people galvanize around them, it's an indication that they will do well. But <laughs> I, I don't think that the results for the minority or minor parties will be any different from what we've seen in the 2016 election. Some interesting names uh, uh, um, have come up and interesting backgrounds and things like that. Gum, uh, Sofo, Chirabosum, and all those people. But if you look at some of the demographics that they, they, they appeal to and the kinds of things they are telling them and how these people are believing them, I, I, I think it will be interesting to see which of them will come up tops in terms of doing better amongst the minor parties. But indeed, it's a straight fight between the NDC and the MPP. Okay. Yeah, and um, 15 have filed. Um, the EC will vet the forms. I don't want to use the word definitely, but definitely some people will be disqualified, as we've seen in previous years and the number may come down when it comes to the final number on the ballot papers. If you've um, noticed, over the years, for example, in 1992, five people got onto the ballot papers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In 1996, it was three parties mm -hmm. that got onto the ballot papers, NDC, MPP, PNC, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the year 2000, it was seven parties, MPP, NDC, PNC, CPP, NRP, GCPP, and UGM. Mm -hmm. 2004, it was four parties. So NRP, GCPP, UGM, they fell off. It was NPP, NDC, PNC, and CPP. 2008, we had eight. Bambata came. You remember Bambata yeah. from Nigeria, yeah. RPD. <laughs> then there was DPP. There was the independent candidate. There was DFP, mm -hmm. PNC, CPP, NDC, and MPP. And in 2012, we had another eight. But this time, RPD didn't come, was replaced by UFP. The independent candidate was there, CPP, PNC, GCPP, and then PPP also showed up, and they placed third, MPP, and DC. And then in 2016, we had seven. So even though 15 have filed, looking at the trends and what we've seen over the years, it's likely we are not going to have the 15 on the ballot papers. We may end up having, I predict, maximum eight. Okay. On the ballot papers. Okay. I predict maximum eight okay. on the ballot papers. I, I think it may be more mm. uh, because the EC is doing something a bit different this time. The EC is calling back some of the candidates to come and correct, correct. Okay. Uh, maybe minor mm -hmm. uh, errors that might have occurred on the ballots. We don't know what kinds of errors they are correcting, but we know that the EC is calling them to come and correct things. Maybe if the errors go to the root of, of the process or the errors are grave, then maybe those people will be disqualified. What happened in 2012 was uh, that Charles, I mean, Charles says team, I mean, they just went ahead and disqualified the yeah. people, which ended, the, which, which, which ended some of them in court, Pakwis, Indum, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that the, the scale of disqualifications will reduce, will reduce compared to what we saw in 2016, because this one, it appears they are working with the candidates to ensure that the minor errors are corrected, so we don't see that happening. But some of the things are grave. For example, so so, the, so six tells us that 
since he's our man at the at the EC. EC. He tells us that there are about two things. One looking at the legal aspect mm -hmm. of things, and another looking at some other thing I'm not sure he mentioned. What they are doing is they, they are trying to ensure that the process as the processes as filed are in or as submitted are in line with the constitutional provision. Article 63, for example, says that a person shall not be a candidate in a presidential election unless he is nominated for election as president by a document which is signed by him. So they will check whether indeed the person signed it. It's signed by no less than two, no less than two persons who are registered voters resident in the area of authority of each district assembly. Mm -hmm. That's why you have the candidates, I mean, taking the forms around the country yeah. for yeah. people to endorse. So they will check all those things to ensure yeah. that the people endorsing are the right people, the numbers, they are right, they are endorsing are the right things, etc. It's to give the, the, the party or the candidate a national flavor, you know, kind of. And it's delivered to the Electoral Commission on or before the day appointed. As, so, so that's what they are, they, 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 are, they are doing now. The person must also appoint a vice president, a uh, vice presidential candidate, and the vice presidential candidate must also go through a certain process, etc. So that's what they are doing now. If it goes to the root of it, for example, the, and so the citizenship and all those things will be checked. If it happens that the, one, of the, one of the people, the candidate or the running mate, is not fully a Ghanaian or is a dual citizen, our laws do not agree or accept that. So that goes to the root of it, that you will be, you will be disqualified. Mm -hmm. So um, it will be interesting to see what reasons will be used to disqualify people if indeed they will disqualify any because we are told they are correcting some errors. Okay. It will be interesting to see what happens. I don't know if the EC is speaking this evening or maybe they will defer that to Monday. I don't know. Okay. All right. Guys, I want to take you to another matter. Independent candidates, uh, before um, I let you have your say on that matter, I want to take you to the Ashanti region, Asokwa, where we have a situation like that there and see how it's panning out over there. It is important to note that the commission has said... Patricia Apieje, who is popularly called Mama Pat, has been the member of parliament for the Asqua constituency since 2012. She was part of the sitting MPs in the Ashanti region who went unopposed during the primaries by the new patriotic party to elect parliamentary candidates. The emergence of independent parliamentary candidates ahead of the December polls has got constituents divided in one of MPP's stronghold. Eric Osei, a former assembly member in the area and a former constituency organizer, explained why he chose to contest as an independent parliamentary candidate. I decided to go for independence, uh, considering a lot of factors. In fact, um, we lack a lot of development in the constituency. And also, our parliamentary candidates, they did not allow anyone to contest her. You know, the masses are crying for change. So I have to listen to them. That's the reason why I've decided to consider the seat as an independent candidate. Although the MPP's reconciliation committee has intervened to stop him from contesting the incumbent MP, some residents have already pledged their support for him. Other residents say Patricia Apieje remains the preferred choice for the Asqua constituency. My party don't know an echo. Sansa or Junior Mahu, a Marcula or Junior Yahu, a dread year you or Baha or near Casacama. I ain't Saha or by Tom to clash a pack here or ye. Mr. Osei tells City News actions by some elements within the MPP on his person will make it difficult for him to rescind his decision. I'm not happy about the way the incumbent MP people are pacing their posters on mine. In fact, it's not nice, it's very bad. Sometimes they tear my banners. 
It's very bad. You have to run a clean campaign. Madame Apieje says she is confident of retaining the seat with a wider margin. I'm very firm on that. I'm very firm on that. But I know the good work we have done already, and I will believe that based on our performance, we should be given another opportunity to continue the work and give you more development. The Asuka constituency is one of the strongholds of the MPP in the Ashanti region. With some few months to election 2020, however, constituents are divided over who to vote for in the parliamentary elections. For now, the decision lies on residents and constituents of Asqua. For City News, half is Tijani from the Asqua constituency. So this trend uh, we are seeing in the Shanti Eastern and uh, I think in w one or two areas and some other um, seen in the BA. You know, BA as well. Yeah, in the Bono region, Bono, sorry. Bono, Bono proper. Yeah. You're seeing that. Uh, and it, it's becoming an issue for the, the parties, especially when the candidate is quite popular and they've decided to go independent and all that. I mean, could you, you have a list of some of the, the, the people we are seeing going independent. Yes. Um, so if you go to Asuka, where we just um, saw the video from Eric Osei, <clears throat> he was an organizer in the constituency. He resigned to go against the incumbent MP, Patricia PJ. Mind you, Patricia PJ was a deputy minister um, of the Ashanti region back then. She became MC of KMA. That's why she's called Ma Pat. Ma Pat. <laughs> yes. When she was MC, that's when the Ma Pat became popular. Mm. And I think if my memory serves me right, she beat um, Maxwell Kofi Juma. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 was also right. a big work in the party mm -hmm. to take so that Sukkot constituency. It's a force to reckon with. She, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So she beat Maxwell Kofi Juma to take over that Sukkot constituency. Mm -hmm. Now, Eric feels that it's a stand to be MP of Asuka, and he feels based on the work he has done on the ground, um, he deserves to run. So he's running against a map part and if you've listened to any of his interviews he said when he wins he knows the party will accept him back into the fold mm -hmm. and you join the majority because he's NPP true and true but yeah. Yeah. he wants to run this year because but, but what are his chances oh, oh, and and would him running even if he lose would he have any impact on, on, on the, the, the numbers in the end we we we've Asuka, if the history of Asuka is anything to go by, and the knowledge we have is anything to stick to. Asuka presidential will be won by the NPP. Mm. No two ways about mm -hmm. that. Now, Eric was um, a, 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 an organizer in the constituency. And for organizers, you know, they do a lot of legwork and connect. Yeah. So this is me trying to think for him. So I think he <laughs> thinks he has done a lot of work in the constituency, and his chances are bright, and he can win. Ground so, person. Yeah, but definitely he will win some votes, which, assuming my part wins, Eric will still win some votes off her. So I expect the presidential votes to go higher uh. than the parliamentary votes. In fact, both of them will end up campaigning for the presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. So I expect the presidential candidates' votes in Asuka to be higher than that of the parliamentary uh, candidate. So it's likely that my part will still t have the day. Uh, we've not done any survey <laughs> in the okay. area, but since yeah. it's happened that my part pushed Maxwell Kofi Juma out, so anything can happen. And in politics, sometimes um, you need to get on the ground to do a, a lot more, um, um, to talk to a lot more people. We are getting feelers that people support Eric, but mm -hmm. based on what we've seen, my part also pulls the crowd. And mm -hmm. like the lady said in the video, they've seen some developments that they believe my part has brought to them. And that means they need to maintain her. Okay. Ashanti region, are we seeing any more um, yes. so, me um, uh, members of parties moving to independence? So, so, so there is, uh, there is Bekwai, there is, um, uh, so we, we just spoke about Asokwa. And uh, yeah, so there's Bekwa, and there is, I think, uh, yeah, there's Bekwa. Okay, so let's do Bekwa, where we have uh, Jose Usu. Jose Usu. I mean, the, the interesting thing about all these is uh, one, they happen often in the strongholds of the parties. Look at all the, the, the list of independent candidates now, or, or people who have submitted to be independent candidates. 
a lot of them actually are in the strongholds of the two parties. And this thing about parties shielding people or trying to protect incumbents from being contested, I, I think it's quite undemocratic. If the person mm. is that good, the person should be able to organize a base. You mm -hmm. cannot be a good MP in Accra and be a bad MP in your constituency because you are the representatives of the people. Mm -hmm. You are not representatives of Accra people. Yeah. So if your people do not find your work, you know, uh, uh, um, good enough, they should be, they, they, they should have the right to change you. Mm -hmm. So the situation where, I mean, party offices will close so people cannot pick forms or people will fill forms and they will be told the forms have expired, etc. Mm. We saw what happened in in, in K Katie Hammond's place, yeah. where one guy was almost beating, you know, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not nice. So, uh, but quite interesting for a reason. Joe Osei in 2008 uh, contested and lost. He was then DVLA boss. They contested and lost. He had issues with the way the elections were run. And he got support from his people. Mm -hmm. He was urged to run as independent. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite a difficult decision for him. Mm -hmm. He did that. Mm -hmm. He ran and then he won. He won yeah. You know, and MPP lost that election at the presidential level and even at the parliamentary, I mean the general parliamentary level. And because they needed the numbers, initially the threat was that if you contest independent, okay. you'll be expelled from the party. Mm -hmm. Some were expelled from the party. But because he was in parliament and they needed the numbers at the time, I think they had some amnesty and they extended another branch to him and he became part of the party. Fast forward party comes to power 2017, he becomes uh, the, the, the deputy speaker, deputy first deputy speaker, speaker yeah. of parliament. Now, he has a similar situation playing up against him. Mm -hmm. Akwesi Amofa Ajima. In this case, the gentleman was not allowed to contest, I think. He wasn't allowed to contest, which is even worse than what he, he went, went through. through yeah. Because he was made to contest, just that he had a problem with the process. And, and the people felt that he had, not, he had not been treated well, so he should run independent. Now, this man, also a lawyer, Akwesi Amofa Ajima, is doing the same thing, and he's running and i've had an interview he granted saying that the worst thing that can happen to anybody is for the person to break <laughs> ranks with a party and contest as independent and even win and he said he was speaking from experience because sometimes the reception you get from the party people even in parliament or when party people meet is not the best but he said he was in that interview he said he wasn't interested in going to, in 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 delving into that and that all he was saying was that he had gone through it and he he, he knew what he felt and that he will advise anybody who has intentions to do so to stop. But it doesn't appear Akwesia Mofa Ajiman is, 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 I mean, is having any of that. He has his own ideas. And as it stands now, it appears he's running. The president, knowing what these things can cause, has been quite categorical in his statements about independent candidates. And I think it was one of the places he visited that he said that he, he cannot work with yeah. any yeah. independent yeah. candidate. So yeah. as they are sending him back to the Jubilee House, he believes, he has to work with people he feels comfortable with, and that he wasn't comfortable with any independent candidate, and that the party has its own candidates to help him do the job. So you have um, Joseph Damte uh, of Asin South, who is also running against the Reverend, Reverend John Fodjo, who is the incumbent. And again, difficulties of the, from the process, people prevent being prevented to pick forms, people um, not being treated fairly in the process, spawn things like this. So this man had a similar problem. You have um, uh, Moro Sechema Yakubu, Fantia Kwa North. The candidate is um, Kwabna Isiyama. It's interesting because if this guy, independent person, Moro, is able to, to do well, MPP may lose that seat because the difference wasn't that much. It was a 2,000 difference, 11,380 yeah. for MPP and 9,472 for the NDC. So if this moral gentleman is able to pull, I mean, given that the dynamics remain the same, is able to pull two, 3,000 or a little more than that, it could put uh, the NDC, MPP candidates in, in, in some danger. Joy Jocelyn Andor of Tapa in Swahim. The candidate there is George Mrekuduka, and if that rings a bell, George <laughs> Mrekuduka and uh, Charles Bissu yeah. recently were engaged in some, yes. in some, in some uh, 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 quarrel or fight, if you like. <laughs> we saw faces, you know, swollen and, and that kind of thing. So this is a lady in, 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 in the middle of that controversy. Okay. If you recall, at that meeting, Mrekuduka accused 
Charles Bissou, who is the regional secretary of the party, that he was supporting, he and some other executives were supporting this lady against him, the MPP candidate. And Joyce Merkuduka, uh, uh, Joy Jocelyn Andor, I mean, appears quite well oiled, I mean, financially. When she, she launched a very flamboyant campaign with posters, everything, and promising a lot of things. And the interesting thing about her campaign is that the logo looks very much like the MPP logo, just that the, 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 okay. the what's the name? The elephant is not in the middle, <laughs> it's just a number of hands. But if you look at it from afar, you think it's elephant. Exactly. And, and it's promising quite a, 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 a number okay. of things. Well, we have to hold uh, with the rest. Uh, I promise we'll wrap them up um, on Monday when we continue um, the conversation. Our time's up. Um, thank you so much for those who sent messages. Um, and thank you very much, gentlemen. Salam Adonu, Head of Features and Articles here at City FM and City TV, and Kojo uh, Wati, heads our new media team here at City FM and City TV. The repeat of this show comes off tonight at 10 p.m., but we'll return on your screens proper on uh, Monday at 3. We'll look at the rest of the independent candidates, the impact on the contest proper, among others. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. Hi, my name is Daniel Crantin, and this is Offside. This season's Premier League has been very, very interesting. Obviously, the Premier League, the best league in the world, always serves up a lot of surprises. But what we've experienced in the past couple of game weeks, Manchester City losing 5-2 at home against Leicester City, and the double disaster this weekend, Man United suffering a 6-1 home defeat against Tottenham Hotspur, and then Liverpool just a few hours later suffering a 7-2 defeat at way at Aston Villa. It just shows you how very difficult this league is. Now, what it shows and, and what it highlights is that a lot of teams now going forward are very, very potent. We also saw West Brom scoring three goals against Chelsea before Chelsea came back to, to level that particular one. Defensive organisation is very important in this league. If you don't have a good defence, you'll probably not reach anywhere in the, in, the, in the Premier League. And Manchester United, let's just use them as a case study. They've been absolutely pathetic in the last, in fact, post-lockdown, just before the season ended defensively and then carried on to this season. Yes, if you look at last season on the whole, they had a good defensive record, second or third best in the league. But the way they started this, uh, this Premier League season has been absolutely shambolic. Crystal Palace, who don't score a lot, managed to score three at Old Trafford. When you look at the leader at the back, it's supposed to be the captain, Harry Maguire. But if he continues to make these fundamental errors, like what we saw against Manchester City, United are really going to have a very long and difficult season. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer needs to look at his defence as a whole, and the team needs to start learning how to defend properly. You cannot just single out individual players, but obviously, the captain Maguire must also